Hi there and good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. So tonight we've, we've got the first of three series on fodder beet and tonight we are focusing on sheep. So I'm Kirsten Williams, I am a beef and sheep consultant with SAC Consulting and I'm going to be your chair for this evening. We've got an excellent guest speaker this evening and Dr Jim Gibbs all the way from New Zealand. Unfortunately, the weather sounds pretty bad over in New Zealand and Jim's connection is uh, coming and going. So hopefully we, we can hold on to him for an hour this evening. And in the background, we've got Malcolm McDonald, who is helping with any technical issues. So we're going to run for an hour this evening. So we aim to finish for nine o'clock and we're going to have plenty of chance for you to ask some questions as well so please do ask some questions. We've got a chat box and a question box so use those to submit questions into myself and Malcolm and we'll keep an eye on them and we'll put them to Jim at the end. It's really 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 great opportunity tonight to have um, Jim Gibbs here with us. Jim is a fountain of knowledge of all things fodder beet. Um, I call him the fodder beet guru. He is a ruminant nutritionist, he's a vet. He's been involved in fodder beet out in New Zealand for numerous years and has come across every problem there is to come across with livestock. So you've got a really, really unique opportunity tonight to ask questions to Jim. Um, I've got a photo there just to show that yes, we have got Jim joining us from New Zealand, but he was over last year in Scotland and that is him up in Inverness on a farm. So he very much understands the conditions that we are working with here in Scotland and how it yields over here as well. We've also got some polls and we're just going to start this evening just with a few polls, just to try and understand uh, how long you've been growing it, what you're feeding it to, just to help Jim a little bit know who his audience is. So Malcolm, can you please launch the first poll? Okay, so how many years have you grazed or grown fodder beet? So this is my first year, two to three years, three to five years or five plus years. Okay, there's our results in. So a high majority, Jim, are growing it for the first year, almost 70%. This is their first year with beet and two to three years, 20%. So we've got a fairly new growing crowd here this evening. Next, next um, poll is just about to be launched. And this is maybe a difficult question when so many of you, it's your first year, so maybe better for the second, third, fourth year growers. Have you encountered any problems? Okay, that's good. The majority are no, but there is 35% say yes. So please do type in what that problem has been so we can address it. And our third and final poll before we hear from Jim this evening is just to get a feel of what your plan is to do with the beet. So what stock class have you or do you plan to graze? So for yows, which Jim was asking if we spell yows differently, given that we, we say it different. So he's going to try and drop in speaking uh, Scottish tonight. Uh, replacement lambs, finishing lambs, replacement and finishing or other. So from what is coming in so far, it looks like the largest majority is yows. So 55% is yows, uh, about 20% are other cattle, and we've got we don't we've got a small amount of finishing lambs. So that's something that we will touch on later on. So just as um, Malcolm transfers the control of the screen over to Jim, just to set the scene a little bit. Fodder beet is a crop that is growing in popularity greatly across Scotland and I think from seeing how many new growers there are there on the poll it really shows that there's a real thirst for knowledge in fodder beet. Um, it is extremely high yielding, it's got excellent nutrition and it's got a lot more opportunities for controlling agronomy, especially weeds, um, compared to your traditional neep or your, your brassicas. So there's a huge amount of it in the ground and I hope tonight you'll get a better understanding of how to deal with the crop. So I'm going to hand over to you, Jim. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, and uh, welcome to all the listeners on this 
uh, webinar, the first of a series of them. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to turn off my screens and uh, my voice will continue and I'll switch over to the other screen now. So um, hopefully this will work. Um, tonight, we're in, the, in the first of these webinars, we're talking about uh, fodder beef in sheep specifically. So I know there are a few people there who have got cattle on it. Um, we'll be doing future ones uh, specifically on cattle and it might be slightly more relevant, but some of the principles of this are the same. However, we will be focusing on sheep and some of the troubleshooting because there are some very different grazing approaches to use the fodder beef in sheep. So this will be quite specific tonight to all the classes that um, Kirsten had first put. So to give a broad outline where we're going, I'll speak a little on the crop itself. Um, not, I won't spend too much time on that, but targeting specifically some of the aspects of that crop that make the grazing management a little trickier. And then we'll talk about some systems, a lot of different livestock class systems uh, quite specifically as well. So for them, we'll certainly do the ewe wintering, which seems to be where most of you are at the moment anyway, and then look at the uh, younger stock systems, both wintering in the hogs and maybe your givers, and also uh, spend some time on the lamb finishing systems and some of the peculiar challenges around that. <clears throat> One thing that I'll bring forward uh, quite early on that is protein nutrition in sheep. Protein nutrition is a far more important uh, aspect of the sheep systems than it is of the beef system. So we'll spend some time on that uh, early. So with a, a short background of uh, the crop itself, and I'm, I'm, I recognize that uh, many in the audience would already be quite familiar with this, but there's a couple of points that are worth making. Uh, Kirsten mentioned that the popularity in New Zealand has increased greatly over the last 10 years. And what you have on the screen in front of you at the moment is, uh, is by far and away the most important aspect of what's driven that for on farm. And, and it's really two things. The first one is it's a very high yielding crop. I mean, the highest uh, consistent yields in New Zealand at the moment are over 35 tonnes of dry matter and the highest observed and uh, independently certified yields this year were well into the 40s. So it's a very, very high yielding crop. We certainly don't have any other crop that um, yields anything like that. And on top of that, it's a very consistent and high ME. It, it's effectively an ME of 12 from autumn right through to the next spring, and it doesn't really move at all. Now, because it's such a high yielding crop, uh, precision grown and with the third inputs that it has uh, independently, it still ends up being an extremely cheap crop. So even in Scotland, um, and so the real prices that are put up on the screen from recent times, the, the lower end of the cost per kilogram dry matter is 5p. So it's similar to New Zealand. I mean, that's a significant saving on just dry matter, but also particularly if you're costing it out in terms of the cost per ME unit. And we really don't have an alternative better than that in New Zealand. And I'd suggest probably in Scotland, it's the same. But some basics around it, it'll, at your latitude and uh, weather, it will always be a spring sown crop. And from little things sown in spring, big things grow. And there's two parts of the crop yield. And, and in later webinars, we'll address some of this more specifically. But realistically, uh, it can be a very large bulb. And that makes no difference at all to sheep. First thing that people say when they see some of these large bulbs is, oh, well, you know, they're not able to eat it. Actually, the larger the bulbs are, the further they are at the ground, the easier it is for them to eat. So despite it being a really large bulb crop, sheep can take to it without any trouble. The other component is that your yields are really driven on plant number. So the crop that you see in front of us was a, uh, a very large crop. And a component of that is both big bulbs and a really high uh, plant number per hectare. And in later webinars, we'll come back to that again. The important part for us about uh, beet is specifically that there, you're effectively dealing with two feeds in the one crop. And now this becomes very important for sheep and we'll touch on it a few times in the different classes. The first component of this is that in a w agronomically well-managed crop, there'll be approximately 25% of the total dry matter of the crop that will be up in the leaf material. And that is very important. And by and large, although there's some cultivar differences, by and large, that's going to be the result of the agronomy that's applied to that crop. I'll mention this in passing here because it's a very important component for protein, the leaf, as you can see. It really contains all of the protein and all of the macro minerals that we're most interested in. 
Whereas the bulb is effectively one large sugar bomb, one very high energy source, has a relatively low crude protein and spectacularly low in minerals. So as a consequence, it's really important to combine both of them in that grazing diet. And we'll return to that a few times. But with regard to the agronomy that can produce that leaf, we'll just make note here, traditional sugar beet agronomy had very little interest in leaf, particularly later in the season. And there were very strict limits on the nitrogen inputs as a consequence of uh, other material being accumulated in the bulb that interfered with the price you got for sugar out of the bulb. So traditional UK sugar beet agronomy is very different from the agronomy that we require fit for purpose grazing crops. We use a lot more nitrogen and we use it a lot later in the season. And you can see in front of you, even in challenging cold areas, you can hold a really good leaf into, and in this case, late July, early August, which for us is the middle to the end of winter. I'll note one more thing here in passing, because um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to it uh, again. But on the left-hand side, you can see this is a, a table uh, of uh, approximate analyses over many years for us, probably the largest uh, collection of um, these individual values, I, I would imagine, that's in existence. And what you can see is that the dry matter uh, varies enormously. Um, the, the very hard end ranges of this are even further uh, in the bulb. I mean, I've held some of these cultivars in my hands that were 6% uh, dry matter, and I've held some of them that were well into the 20s. So it's, there is a wide range in dry matters, and that sometimes is within cultivars between years. My, my point in showing you this is that be very cautious when uh, using book values because they move a lot. The dry matter in both the leaf and the bulb can move a lot. And the second circle to the right-hand side is the protein. So you can see there that there's a, a very significant difference uh, in the range in both the leaf and the bulb, but also as a general rule of thumb, there's a far, far lower crude protein content of the bulb than the leaf. Or another way of putting this there is without the leaf, you will ordinarily always be under the crude protein requirements. So keeping that leaf is agronomy priority number one. But what are the advantages specifically for sheep systems? Well, most of them we've put into play already. Uh, it's a very high energy source and it can be really cheap. Because it's got such a very high uh, yield, it means that you can have a large stocking rate. So uh, as you move past 20 tonnes of dry matter, and I mean, that's very achievable for, for the Scottish audience, uh, you, you're talking about holding 100 uh, multiples for 100 days per hectare. So that's a significant way to move animals off the farm. So to take them off other pastures to save other land. And as a knockabout rule of thumb, because it's cheap and you can get high inputs on it, your total winter costs fall. And I mean, that's exactly what we find in New Zealand. So the other important point to recognise is that uh, unlike cattle, some of the sheep systems are zero supplement input. And even if they're not zero, they're very, very low supplement input. We'll talk more specifically with each livestock class about that. And then the final point to make is that with the exception of lamb finishing, which we'll address uh, deliberately, the, the other sheep livestock classes that are likely to be on it are all a very adequate protein to energy balance in an agronomically well-husbanded crop. Now, if you've lost all the leaf, that's a different story, but uh, in, and that is a result of agronomy, not weather, and we might come back to that later. But in a well-managed crop, the protein to energy balance is excellent, even for the young growing stock. You hear to the contrary on occasion, and I, I want to be very clear on that, and we'll return to that a couple of times. <clears throat> I'm going to add one more thing here that, uh, that there sometimes is a, some misunderstanding about, and that's how you calculate the total crude protein of the diet. But what we would normally would do and what we taught uh, the industry and, and farmers themselves to do in the earliest days of the grazing systems in New Zealand with beet <clears throat> was to add up the, the components. So if I know the crude protein content of the leaf and how much the, the leaf there is, and I know that of the bulb, and I know the supplement, then I can easily calculate a total diet crude protein. And in the earliest days when we were uh, teaching this and putting this out uh, for people to use. And it was picked up by various um, different groups in the industry. The, uh, there was a far higher use of the lower dry matter uh, cultivars that are a long way further out of the ground. Now, most of you who've uh, fed this for even a period of time will recognize that sheep leave bulb in the ground. And 
they probably leave more in the ground than you first realise. So this is an example of a popular uh, newer cultivar that's a relatively high dry matter type. And we finished a research trial this year looking specifically at this across the industry in the South Island. And it is very common to have more than 50% of the bulb in the ground. So sheep won't get that out of the ground. Now you can get that out yourself by uh, mechanically at the end of the season, but in most cases, the first livestock class to use it through the winter, often wintering ewes, will go across that and they won't get that material out of the ground. And what that functionally means is that the total diet crude protein goes up. Now, I've given you an example there. You can see that if I've got a standard crop with 25% of the dry matter in the leaf, and that leaf is just 20% crude protein, it's often higher, but if it's just 20% crude protein and the bulb was 9% crude protein, then I, I, I come up with a figure there that's 11 to 12%. If I recalculate that for the amount that the first class of livestock don't get out of the ground, which commonly is 50% in some of the cultivars that are common in Scotland at the moment, then the total crude protein of the beet diet that they're having is 13.5%. Now, to put that in real terms, that is the changeover uh, level of crude protein in the diet. There'd be a, be a very brave person who argues that uh, even multiple wintering ewes require more than 13.5% crude protein in their diet. And I mention this, um, and we can come back to them questions as required, but I mention this because one of the things that's been promulgated uh, wrongly in very recent times has been the idea that uh, protein nutrition for wintering ewes, uh, particularly for multiples, is insufficient on beet. Um, for, frankly, the, some of the people who put that information out understand this uh, very poorly and have had no experience at all with uh, fodder beet grazing systems. The final thing that I would note in this one is that uh, you won't expect that your um, supplement, whatever you do in sheep systems, will change your total diet crude protein. The fact is that it will be relatively low, um, 10% and often zero. But even at 10%, it's very difficult to drag the total crude protein up regardless of how high your crude protein supplement is. And that includes, in, when we come around to lambs, uh, nuts, and so for example, supplements that are really high crude protein concentrates. I'm gonna add one little thing here, um, that the way that they eat it is very important to understand. And you can see here for a new daily break, some work that um, uh, Dr. Bernadita Saldez and myself did some years ago and then repeated this year. And what we were looking at was how quickly they eat now, so on the left-hand axis there, you can see that 50% of the entire day, or in this case, two-day break, uh, disappears in a very short time. So within an hour or so, uh, they're, they're chomping through most of it. And of course, specifically, that's going to be mostly leaf. And if you see by the three-hour period there, that uh, again, uh, approximately half in sheep systems, approximately half will have disappeared by that time. And again, a greater proportion of leaf. So what will always happen is that they'll eat that leaf off first. Now the leaf, remember, has all the protein. So there's a discrepancy in the way that they eat it between when they're eating most of the protein and when they're eating most of the energy. And therefore that grazing management becomes more and more important. Now we'll address these uh, ewe wintering systems um, specifically now. Um, some of the positives in ewe wintering, uh, we've already said. The first is that you can have uh, a really high ME intake on this, higher than you have on any other forage. Um, that's an important point to note because I, I also noted in uh, the last year or so that some material was put out in various places, some industry places too, looking at the uh, metabolizable energy content of some different forages. And I noted that um, there was a couple of uh, types of forages, brassicas actually, that were put up there as an ME of 13 or 13 and above. Actually, that's not true, it's uh, completely false. The, the highest uh, ME forage that we have access to is beet bulb, um, between 12 and 12 and a half ME, and the beet leaf is between 11 and a half and 12 ME. So we normally put it as an ME of 12 and it stays, and it's the highest ME forage that we have access to. As a consequence of the really high yields, it means we get a very high stocking rate. But it's the middle point that I'll draw your attention to. Um, for a very low dry matter feed, one of the peculiarities of beet is that once they're well adapted to it, they can achieve very high intakes. Now in cattle, that is approximately 2.2% of their live weight in dry matter every day. Actually in sheep, it's much higher. 
So it's very common in hogs, for example, to have intakes well over 3%, even with very low dry matter feed, and even in uh, multiple gestating ewes. So this is the mid trimester forward, they can still achieve intakes over 3%. That's quite unusual for uh, feeds with a low dry matter, but it's something that's been observed frequently on beet systems. It means that their energy input on this is really strong. As we said before, there is a good protein supply, perfectly adequate for these um, classes, and there's not a lot of supplement that's required. Uh, another point that we'll come to that's different for many of you who've worked with beet in cattle systems is that there really is no transition at all uh, onto the crop. Uh, sheep regulate their intake in a very different way that cattle do, and although it takes them the same period of time, approximately three weeks, to achieve their maximum intakes on that crop, there's no transition period from a management point of view that is required for positive animal production or for good animal health. None at all. And we'll come around to that in a moment. What are the challenges in uh, ewe wintering systems? Well, we've mentioned one of them already. The way that they eat. Uh, means that they will leave a good amount of gold in the ground. So the management, the daily breaks and the strip grazing approach is much more critical in sheep than it is in cattle. Um, and specifically, getting that allocation correct uh, can sometimes be a learning process in the first year or so. If you go too fast, they'll go through it, they'll be eating all of the leaf, they'll leave lots of gold behind, which can be wasteful for that particular class of livestock, even though you dig it up and you might well use it with another livestock class at the end of the season. It's wasteful for the first livestock class, the wintering ewes going across it, and it will change their diet. They're a higher crude protein diet, but a lower energy diet. So getting that management correct is really important. And we'll, we'll come back specifically to that as arguably the most important component of ewe wintering. And the other point to make here is that um, sheep, more so than cattle, are both crop and cultivar sensitive. So uh, agronomically well-grown crops will have more nitrogen in the bowl, they'll have more leaf and more nitrogen in the leaf. They're always more palatable to stock. Uh, agronomically hard-pressed crops, particularly where they've got low nitrogen inputs, can sometimes be very unpalatable to sheep. Now, laid over the top of that, there's a clear uh, preference for different cultivars. So, and it doesn't always follow the dry matter percentage. You hear that sometimes, but that's not true. There's a lot that we don't understand about palatability in cultivar, but there's some very clear uh, cultivar preferences. Now, a lot of that is exacerbated by the agronomy. So if you've got uh, some of these less palatable cultivars that are treated well agronomically, they tend to be uh, fairly satisfactorily palatable. On the other hand, if they're uh, poorly palatable and they're uh, the victim of pretty poor agronomy, then you can have some extremely unpalatable uh, cultivars. And we'll give a demonstration of one of them in a moment. On a practical level for hue wintering, how do we do it? Well, we said that there's no uh, transition at all. The, the classic transition to most very large scale uh, sheep enterprises on beet in the South Island in New Zealand would be they'd be run on and off for a a couple of hours for a couple of days and then locked on the crop. So there's, there's really uh, zero transition at all. Um, the way that they regulate their intake is uh, much stronger. So they don't eat themselves uh, into an early grave in the same way that cattle will do if you did that. However, it is worth noting again that it takes that three week period before they achieve their maximum intakes. So in that first uh, period, you have to supply more supplement because they simply won't be eating that much of the beet. Now that supplement can be supplied um, best by grazing, otherwise by making sure that they had access to something that was reasonably palatable and would fill them up for the rest of their diet uh, beyond that component of their diet that was beet. So note that although you're not managing the allocation in the same way we do with cattle, you still have to manage the supplement that's supplied to them. Now, the other preparation before they're going on that's really important is that uh, sheep are spectacularly sensitive to clostridial deaths on beet. Now, the particular uh, clostridial deaths that they suffer are uh, clostridium perfringens type D, which uh, many of your audience will know as pulpy kidney in lambs. Now, the, the, a component of that, or the most important component of that, is um, uh, sheep are sensitive to sugar arriving in the small intestine, and you get an overgrowth of clostridial uh, bugs there that produce a toxin that produce this disease syndrome. 
And in beef, we have a lot of water and we have a lot of sugar. And at high intakes, uh, they do wash a reasonable amount of that sugar into the small intestine and beyond the rumen. As a consequence, the challenge from clostridial diseases is stronger. Now, the standard, um, uh, very basic clostridial vaccines work perfectly well. There's no requirement for uh, more sophisticated or expensive clostridial vaccines. The original uh, five in one uh, works really well, but it is very important that even the adult stock have a um, pre-crop uh, booster. And certainly when we come around to the lambs and the young stock, you more or less find all the ones that you don't get in the vaccination. So you have to be very careful for uh, vaccines in there. We would normally drench them before they went on. There's no larval burden on the crop. Of course, if they're co-grazing a pasture, which is a cheap and effective way to do it, then there may be a requirement for further drenching. But in general terms, if they're on the crop with um, conserved feeds and there's zero larval burden in that time, so a drench before they go on winter is sufficient. And then there's regional trace element um, deficiencies that have to be addressed. Now this varies from region to region, but the point that comes into play here is that uh, soil intake is fairly strong in these systems. So in the New Zealand environment, the soils are relatively low in selenium and beet is low in selenium. So we're always addressing selenium deficiencies and particularly on crop. And copper is the other one. Uh, with a lot of soil intake, you're getting a lot of iron. If there's a high molybdenum content in that soil, you can also have direct copper uh, tire as a result of that molybdenum. So in some regions, copper is required. Uh, local veterinary advice is important on, on this matter. Now, two other um, practical bits are that um, paddock design will help you or hinder you. Uh, it's not as critical as it is in cattle, and it certainly doesn't drive production in the same way that uh, it does with cattle, but it's still important to make your wintering a pleasant affair. The, the heart and soul of paddock design is space. And uh, for use, that would typically mean three to four per linear meter of the, the hot wire in front of you. And as a general rule of thumb, they're a little bit under one per metre square of the crop for agronomically well husbanded crops. So you, you end up allocating approximately a one square metre or a little over one square metre for, um, the, for this livestock class. So between the two of them, uh, you can get a good idea on what positive and negative paddock design is. Remember, the wetter the weather, the better the utilisation will be in longer phases. So you know, potentially you can make a square and allocate them on that, but the utilisation, particularly the leaf, will fall down in those cases. And if you've got lighter and shyer stock, then they get pushed out, not to the same degree that they do with cattle, but they still get pushed out. And then the final point and the practical point goes back to what we mentioned before with the uh, difference between the leaf and the bulb and protein in particular. And this is where sheep are very different in terms of that allocation. If I over allocate, for these groups, so not in the early stages, but once they're up to maximum intakes. If I over allocate, they'll eat, always eat all of the leaf and they'll eat a component of the bulb. And as they get um, deeper down towards the ground and then into the ground, they'll slow down. If I continually over allocate, I'll leave more and more bulb behind. Now I've changed their diet then. I've increased their crude protein in their diet and I've decreased the energy of their diet. On the other hand, if I under allocate and force them to eat further down into the ground or chew off most of those bulbs the best that I can, then it's very easy for me to fall into the trap where I've actually made them work pretty hard for the amount that they've got, but I've under allocated their energy intake for the day. So I go back to what I said before with that crop. We would normally be working for the ewes on allocating three to three and a half percent of their live weight in dry matter. So for a lot of those crops, that will mean that I'm allocating two and a half kilograms of beet there or thereabouts for a 60, 70 kilogram ewe. So that uh, allocation in sheep systems is a, is a much more important guide uh, for normal production than it is in cattle systems, because in cattle systems, you can look and see just by what they're leaving behind. And it is not nearly so straightforward to do that in sheep systems. <laughs> I often get asked the question, um, do we have to move it every day? And in sheep systems, no. Um, uh, daily breaks are relatively rare. Of course, in very uh, wet or heavy soils, they can improve utilisation. But as a general rule, even in the fairly wet places, it's two or three day breaks. 
Now, note we said before when they go on, they'll eat most of the leaf immediately and they'll eat it uh, all within that first period. So as a consequence, they're then going to be on a lower crude protein diet. If you go to three day breaks, the, the, the protein cycle for the, the ruminant doesn't run much beyond three days. So if you go to three day breaks, then what you find is that you're left with a diet that they're uh, eating that has insufficient group protein, both for the normal rumen function and for the animal. So as a consequence, what will happen is their intakes will slow down in the later part of that break. Now, as they're, if they're multiples and heavy use in particular in multiples, then you can run into a problem with that where you get uh, ketosis or sleepy sickness um, prior to getting closer to lambing, even though they're surrounded by energy, even though there's bulbs everywhere on the ground, if they don't have that match of protein and energy when they're eating it, they just won't eat it. So their intakes will fall down and then you run into that paradoxical sleepy sickness. That was not an uncommon problem with ewe uh, systems in the early part of our grazing experience in New Zealand. So as a general rule, when you move to three day breaks, you're, you're hovering on the edge of that. Two day breaks, you're normally comfortably within it and they're a, a pretty good match for the amount of labor you're putting in and the result you're getting out. And then the final point on this one would be the supplement. Um, as we said earlier, in an agronomically well-grown crop, your supplement can be zero. Uh, it'll provide the fiber content, it'll provide the uh, protein content, and for that matter, even the calcium and phosphorus content in the overwhelming bulk of cases. And therefore, there's no uh, a priori reason that you need to put another supplement in. However, in most cases, uh, there will be some supplement put in, and as a general rule of thumb, that will be approximately 100 grams of dry matter a day. But in two or three day breaks, of course, the way that that would normally work is that they're also given the supplement um, on a multi-day basis. So, for example, it might be that they uh, have access to a strip grazing every second day. And um, that might be on the off day for them having the line moved on the beet crop. I mean, that wouldn't be an uncommon example in New Zealand. And if, uh, if higher production is required, and in most cases in sheep, you don't have to work too hard to get that, but if the absolute maximum production is required, they will eat more if they're given a very small amount of supplement. There's always a sweet spot for that supplement. As that supplement level goes up, they'll eat less beet, their production will go down, you often have more trouble. But at the other end, if the supplement is zero, they do actually eat a little less than they will if there's a small amount of supplement that's put in there. Note also that um, if it's not an agronomically well husband crop, if your leaf has fallen off in autumn, or if you're in a winter period and, and it isn't strong leaf that's holding on, both of which are influenced by agronomy, then what you can find is that bulb with no leaf uh, won't have protein, and then there's an absolute demand for supplement. In those cases with low leaf, there is an absolute demand for a protein component in that supplement, and you need to be quite careful with that. And then the final point that I'd make is that um, if supplements being put out there, um, be cautious the way you're doing it to make sure that they can all get to it, particularly if you're using low levels of supplement. So we often use the example of medium round bales, 200 kilograms of dry matter in a medium round bale there or thereabouts. Uh, well, you know, potentially um, that's gonna be 100 grams for 2000 sheep. Well, we can all appreciate that that's probably not gonna happen. So the, the way that you put uh, that supplement out becomes important. It's one of the reasons why strip grazing uh, is very effective because it does allow an even access. However, there's various different ways that they can be done. It is important to make sure that your access matches your allocation. So we want to speak about the growing out stock here, which is um, many of the same principles, but uh, we'll, we'll address lambs slightly differently. So the first thing to note is both hog and gimmer uh, wintering systems can work very well. I say that because I hear in different places, people say, no, it doesn't work. Actually, it, it works very well, and it's done very effectively in New Zealand in many, many uh, enterprises. What, what is required in these circumstances, and there's no getting around this, is good leaf. It, it, it is not a system that can work for you if agronomically you haven't produced good leaf. Um, a, a, another researcher, Nadisha Jayasinghe and myself, several years ago, looked specifically at uh, hog intakes and growth rates. And we were using uh, unrestricted feed intakes with a very, very low uh, grass silage input. Uh, this was a five odd percent uh, of their total ration input. 
And what uh, we demonstrated really closely with this was that their intakes were very high, even a very low dry matter uh, cultivar as well. But their intakes on a daily basis were very high and they were doing somewhere between 175 and 200 grams a day live weight gain. So there's no question that they can be done and done very well. However, many of the systems where it's failed have just had low leaf. Now, because their protein requirement, because uh, they're still growing out, is slightly higher, the total group protein of their diet is much more important and leaf will supply that. I'll just make one note here. Um, often there's a misconception that if your leaf is gone, you can supply that protein component by supplement. But that's not true. Um, it's extremely difficult to do outside of using specific protein concentrates. And the reason is because the, if you go back to the feed table that we put up earlier in the webinar, you can see that even in older leaf, the fiber content, the neutral detergent fiber content is relatively low. And it's certainly low in well-managed leaf compared to most of the other supplements. And so what this means is if you don't have the leaf and you supply something else, even good quality grass in winter, then ordinarily what you're doing is you're raising the total fiber of the diet. And in beet systems, what we've noticed uh, plenty of times over the year, both in industry and in research, is it takes a very small increase in that daily fiber intake to dramatically decrease the beet intake. So you see this in sheep very clearly. So if I don't have any leaf and I put in a good quality grass silage, they won't eat as much beet as they would have if I was supplying that protein through the leaf. So the, the supplement becomes really important in those um, uh, younger growing out systems, no getting around that, but leaf is more important. And then uh, down the bottom, I've got a single other point. Uh, they are, with the exception of the lambs that we'll get to, the single most fussy group when it comes to cultivar and crop. So there are some cultivars that are really unpalatable and they won't go well on them, particularly if they're not uh, agronomically well managed. And on top of that, the agronomy to have lots of leaf, high quality leaf, high nitrogen leaf and high nitrogen bulbs becomes really important in maintaining and achieving these high intakes. This is an example of where the wheels have fallen off completely. So, you know, I mean, in this case, um, with all the goodwill in the world, a new entrant farmer uh, was putting stock across this, it was agronomically poor crop, um, treated rough and an uh, unpalatable cultivar, and he just couldn't make them eat it. So what happened is that you can see they'd scallop off all of the leaf and uh, scarcely any of the bulb, even the ones in front of you, you can see they're hardly even nibbled at. So uh, without putting any pressure on them, this particular farmer was just moving them forward and forward and forward. And you can see um, by the time I was called into this, this is what we would call a, a categoric disaster and uh, quite a difficult one to turn around to. We're going to spend our last little section here talking with uh, lambs on beet and um, specifically some of the difficulties with them. And the first difficulty I'll put up front, uh, you really can't do it. Um, lamb finishing on beet uh, is, is not ordinarily a viable proposition. And it's difficult and relatively expensive to get more than about 100 grams a day live weight gain. And the reason for it is really simple. Uh, you can have very high stocking rates. You've got an extremely high energy crop. But for the reasons that we said before, the crude protein, even when they're eating most of that, will be something like, so when they're eating all of the leaf and half of the bulb, they won't eat it very far into the ground with lambs. The crude protein will be something around 13 to 14% uh, if it's done well. Lambs have a much higher requirement for protein, particularly when they've got high energy intakes. So as a consequence of that, you find it very difficult to increase that protein to the point where their live weight gains are optimized. And um, if 100 grams a day was a suitable um, live weight gain, then it certainly can be done at very high stocking rates. And the way that it's used in New Zealand by and large is that autumn lambs are bought earlier when they're cheaper. They put on beet at extraordinary stocking rates, so 200 hectare or above. They can be held on that for a long period of time and they're effectively used like an ATM. You uh, go to that bank and you take out the tranche of lambs and then you finish them. because They've been going forward slowly at 100 grams a day and you finish them on some other forage, often for uh, high value winter markets. So it's a, it's a difficult system to do lambs directly, um, particularly across that winter period. 
Now, note what sometimes happens is people say, as we mentioned in the previous slides on uh, hog and gimmer wintering, well, um, I'll have more inputs into this and therefore I'll raise that crude protein. Well, ultimately this is simply a maths question and it was some of the research we did in the earliest days looking directly and explicitly at lamb finishing to try and work out what was the proportion of non-beet high protein supplements in their diet if we wanted to achieve optimal live weight gains. And I mean, even using very high quality lucent inputs on it, it was effectively 50%. So it's a very difficult one to increase by supplement. And of course, they're quite sensitive to the fiber input. So as a general rule, their beat intake will then go down and it can be a difficult system to do high live weight gains on. Um, and that includes uh, in the UK, the use of uh, different high uh, protein concentrate materials like protein nuts, et cetera. Even with them, it can be a difficult one to achieve really high live weight gains on. The alternative um, on lamb finishing is instead to use um, pastures and beet on the pasture at about that 50-50 arrangement that we've just mentioned, where the beet is just simply picked up from the paddock across that time and put out on the pasture. Now, in this case, what can happen is it's often two day breaks and they're done once a week. So that beet can be picked up on a, a single weekly basis and spread out to match the dry matter requirements. So it's effectively equal to the pasture that they're going to eat in each of those two day breaks. It can be put out a week ahead of them. And then that line can just simply be moved as you're going through that week basis. In colder weather like Scotland can actually be done every two weeks. So it can be out on that pasture for a long period of time before they get to it. So it's a straightforward process to do it. It's a different approach to using beet on it. And of course it does require the use of um, a beet bucket. In some environments, that's difficult. Even in our wettest environments, we have a saying that you get one day a week that you can get onto it. So um, it, it may well be the same in uh, many areas of Scotland, particularly the Inverness Aberdeen region. Note, uh, one thing with the lambs that we'll come to in a moment is um, the clostridial vaccine. So uh, be reminded that lambs are the most sensitive to those clostridial diseases and it's an absolute requirement to have a full vaccine before they go onto the crop. Losses on that can be very, very strong if they're not fully vaccinated uh, before they go onto the crop. And the losses, unlike clostridial disease in cattle, the losses in lamb systems start almost immediately on going on the crop. So we'll spend the last little bit on troubleshooting. Um, and the first one is they just don't like the crop and I can't get them onto it. Uh, nine times out of 10, that will be the agronomy in the cultivar. Nine times out of 10. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you don't have uh, systems and you don't have flocks that don't like beet. You know, I hear that occasionally and it's just simply not true. They, they get onto it and they all get onto it with too much trouble, but they are very sensitive, much more sensitive than cattle to well-grown crops or poorly grown crops and they're very sensitive to cultivar. So you have to be cautious in both of them. And if those things are good, good leafy green crops, always pull stock on to eat quicker. Crops that are poor in leaf or low in leaf are always much harder. And as a general rule, if they're poor in leaf, they won't have grown out of the ground as far. Uh, the way that beet grows, it grows into the ground first. And then when it grows larger and it's flourishing, it grows out of the ground after that. Poorly grown crops often grow into the ground and stop. They don't grow very far out. Sheep are forced to eat the crowns, which they don't like, and then to uh, nibble down and cone them down. And as a general rule, intakes will fall down, production will fall down, and it's very hard to get them on in the beginning. But the other one is uh, we mentioned there is timing. Well, there's a few things with this, but um, if uh, if it isn't particularly if it isn't an agronomically well-grown crop and you don't have much leaf, then one thing you have to do is make sure that when you put them on, they're hungry. Number one, and number two, that you leave them on in that first period for a few hours, not just for a very short time. They work out times really quickly, so you need to put them on at the time when their appetite cycle is working for you, not against you and you need to leave them on. Um, poor production, um, by and large, that it will always come down to protein. And uh, as a consequence of that, it will pretty much always come down to that leaf bulb proportion or the farmer allocation. In the case where there's no leaf at all or where the leaf is suboptimal, then the supplement becomes much more important and it certainly becomes more important in the lamb systems and in uh, the hog and gimmer systems where you're still growing them out. But the principal component of poor live weight or just doing poorly on them 
uh, is around the protein input and that will be leaf bulb proportion. No, no questions around that. Uh, remember what we said before with allocation, if you keep moving forward in allocation, they're eating more protein of a lower energy diet and they're leaving more and more of that bulb behind, which is a higher energy component of their diet. And if you're too light in your allocation and you're making the meat down into the ground, uh, because they slow down in how hard they'll eat as you force them harder and harder to do it, what you can often find is that you're under allocating the energy in the diet. So that allocation becomes very important. And we mentioned this before as a good example. You can see there um, in this case, so we moved across it, moved across it, and really their energy intake out of this was marginal. And then our final one, we mentioned the, the principal issue will never be acidosis. In a career in developing these systems right from the beginning, I could count a handful of animals, sheep that is, that have had genuine clinical acidosis on B. They regulate their intake much better. And most of the time, the deaths that have been uh, blamed on acidosis are really clostridial. However, the clostridial losses can be really high. And the younger and smaller the animals are, the stronger and stronger that challenge is. Um, in, a, in another webinar uh, series, or actually I think it's a podcast series for FAS, we're gonna address some of the animal health difficulties um, specifically, but we'll talk more about some of the causes of clostridial vaccination in that. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kirsten and take questions from the audience. Great, thank you very much for that, Jim. There has been plenty of questions coming in. Um, I think we'll maybe just start, start at the start and work our way through them. But please, if anybody does have any questions or anything that arises as we're going through the questions, just pop them into the question box. So the first one, I think you have already addressed, to be honest, but we'll just cover it again. And that is what expected live weight gain is there on this crop? So you said that your your, your kind of growing stock, your, your hogs would be getting about 175 to 200 grams per day, whereas your finishing lambs, not so much, about 100 grams. Is there anything else you want to add to that, Jim? Well, the only one would be in terms of use, uh, pregnant use on the crop over there. Most people aren't going to work on a live weight gain, but a body condition score. Um, I might have to turn, I might have to turn my camera off because I think it's <laughs> freezing on that. Um, Kirsten, I'll, I'll just, I'll do that. So sorry to the uh, audience on that one. Um, and, but um, for, for the ewes, normally it would be body condition gain that people are looking at. And because the ewe intake is really high, a heavier ewes, particularly if they're not multiples, their body condition gains can be much stronger. Uh, they can be very strong. In fact, um, in uh, for singles, you have to be a bit cautious about that because the body weight gains on beet will be higher than almost anything else except uh, grain. So it's, it's quite normal to uh, have very strong body condition gains over that. And if you're not careful with that, sometimes that can become a problem. Um, in multiples, larger use, particularly with multiples, triplets as an example, their body weight gains in the early part of that will be very strong. In the mid um, part of their pregnancies is still reasonably strong. And then they coast through on that for the last part of their pregnancy. So, um, yep, we, we work on growing out live weight gains of about 200 grams a day for hoggets as a maximum. But for lambs, as we said before, it depends on your inputs. If they're just on crop and they're eating and working their way through crop, 100 grams is a pretty good feed. And monitoring the, the kind of growth as the season progresses as well, just to see exactly what, what they are doing. And if there's anyone who's who's not eating the beet, then that will fairly indicate them to, to know to take them off the beet as well, won't it, Jim? It, it is. And there's two things that I would say as a way. Um, low, weight on, low weight gains on beet can be a little bit of a tricky beast. And um, as many of the audience would recognise, if you've got a very low dry matter feed, you're eating a lot of water. Uh, like to, to give that in perspective, the example of the study that I gave before on hoggets, so for 60 kilogram animals, they could be urinating almost 15 litres a day. Just, you know, let that sink in. I mean, the, the water intake on them is absolutely enormous. So their water outputs are really strong. And that's some of the adaptations to the crop. What that means for live weight gains though, is you have to be quite careful what part of their daily cycle you're weighing them in, because I mean, 15 liters can be 15 kilograms. So it's really easy to have uh, 
shifts in lightweight gain that just aren't real depending on where, where you've taken them in the day. So what we try and get people to do is to work very carefully on what allocation is. Very easy to measure your face length, very easy to measure how many square metres you've actually allocated to the flock and what number there are. And it's possible and, and most people should do it now to get very accurate yields on what the crop has. That way you can work out what their intakes really are. And of course, people by eye can see that they're doing well or they're doing badly. But uh, sometimes those live weight gains can be a tricky beast to work on, particularly if you're doing them short interval. So there is some caution required with that. Okay. There's somebody else asking what the expected utilisation is of the crop. And obviously that will depend on how far the bulb is out the ground, if it's a low dry matter or if it's a high dry matter crop. Um, I think you spoke there about a kind of average of 50% out the ground, but then the yows do cone down as well, don't they, Jim? They do. And so th that's a very difficult question to answer um, if, we're, if we're talking about the first livestock class that goes across that crop. But note uh, one, what I mentioned when we were talking about the ewes in particular. It's very common for them to have uh, an area allocated to them and then to be moved off prior to lambing. And in most cases in that, as it dries up a little bit in spring, people would put the grubber through that paddock and lift all that beet up onto the ground and then use it with another class of livestock on farm. So what we've demonstrated over many years is that utilization is very, very high. Bulb utilization is effectively 100%. Wherever we've measured this, we've not measured it under 97%. Now in very heavy wet weather, leaf utilization can be lower at high stocking rates. They tramp a bit into the mud and some of that stays there, not a lot. But bulb utilisation can be high. But I think the question that the, the farmer is asking in that case is, is there, um, for that first livestock class that goes across there, is there a ready figure for utilisation that we would use? Um, in the upright varieties, the sort of mangle end upright varieties, then, uh, and, and we've looked at this specifically in research, in fact, this year just passed, on um, industry level to go and find what people had in, right across the South Island. And as a general rule of thumb, they'll have 25% or less of the bulb in the ground. And then as you pointed out, if they're palatable cultivars, sheep will cone down into the ground. Um, they only cone down to the inside edge of their eye. They won't put their eyes underground. So um, if you see the sheep that are eating it, what you'll find is they have a muddy nose and all around their mouth, you can spot them without any trouble, but they won't go in further than their eyes. Uh, if, you, if you have the upright varieties that are very uh, palatable, that means actually there's not very much left at all. On the other hand, there's been a move towards higher yielding varieties without always a recognition that they're off, there's a relationship with a higher yield being higher and higher, and deeper and deeper, I should say, into the ground. Now, in those cases, some of the cultivars that were being used in New Zealand this year had 80% of the weight of the bulb in the ground. 80%. So you can appreciate that while the first diet moving across had a high crude protein, they were not going to get a lot of that 80% out of the ground on their first pass. The farmer's going to have to use that in a subsequent livestock allocation. So to answer in short, it's a difficult figure to put on. Utilisation can be very, very high, but you have to pick that cultivar carefully. Okay, this next one is quite a long question, so bear with me and I'll read it out. What is the best way to get the bulb out of the ground? I am struggling to understand how the sheep get higher levels of crude protein when they don't eat the full bulb. So um, as an example, if we said, and I'll go back to the example just to keep the maths really easy. If we said that the protein content of the leaf was 20% and the protein content of the bulb was 10%, and I, I pull the bulb out of the ground and throw the whole plant to the animal, then uh, you can see that what we're going to have then is three quarters of that plant is at 10% and only one quarter of the plant is at 20%. Yeah, now, if I cut that bulb directly in half and I throw half of it away, which is effectively what I'm doing for the first livestock class that goes across there, if they can't get that bulb out of the ground and they don't eat down into the ground, then now what I've got is I've got 50% of the plant that's 20% and 50% that's 10%. So I've automatically moved my crude protein from 12.5% straight up to 
So that's the reason why the crude protein goes up if they're leaving some of the bulb in the ground, because the bulb has a much lower crude protein than the leaf. Now you have to be careful when you use that bulb for something else later on, but there's usually plenty of dry stock classes on farm that can make the most of the rest of that paddock. And that's why that crude protein content, uh, well, there's some material that's um, been put out in recent times around use in particular, protein nutrition on fodder beet. And it, frankly, it's just very inexperienced and um, foolish. And it, it misunderstands the way that the crop is actually used and just has no real experience of um, either nutrition or fodder beet systems, frankly. Okay, the next question came in when you were talking about yows and when you were talking about preparing to go into the crop. And on your slide, it said drench and then clostridial. So somebody is asking a drench of what before they go onto the beet? Oh, normally just drenching against nema gut nematode. So just drenching against parasites. Sorry, my mistake there. So that, that is just to say that um, when, when they're on the crop, particularly if conserved feeds like silage, for example, are, are being fed to them or no supplements being fed to them while they're on the crop, there's zero parasite, zero larvae on that crop land, zero. So if they're, if they're carrying a worm burden when they go on um, and you drench them, then um, they're not gonna pick up any more larvae while they're on the crop. So it's not an uncommon thing for them to be drenched at the point when they're going onto the crop because then they're gonna have a larvae free, parasite free period make the most of that nutrition over that um, winter period. Okay, I've got two, two different questions here I'm going to amalgamate because I think the answer will be quite similar. So the first is, do you only feed sheep fodder beet that's in the ground? So can you pull it and feed it away from, it, from where it's grown, which obviously you can, but then somebody's also asking if you lamb inside, what's the best way to transition off beet? So I think the two of them will link in quite nicely yep. together. Okay, so certainly for the first question, um, I mean, weather and soil dependent, uh, it's really easy to get beet out of the ground uh, at the time. So leave it growing, leave it in, uh, in place uh, through that autumn and winter, and then pull it out with a beet bucket um, as required and feed it out on pastures. And we gave that example with lambs. Well, we actually do quite a lot of that with um, you post lambing systems in New Zealand as a feed supplement. So in those cases, what would happen is for um, post lambing, they would have uh, a very large amount usually of beet put out once a week. So what it amounts to is a large pile of beet put out in the paddock once a week, and then they go and eat it you know, as they wish. They're on set stocked on pasture and they can go and eat it as they wish. So uh, that system is really common and that can work very well. The driver of the popularity of that system is just that beet is hands down by a comfortable margin, the most, uh, the highest uh, ME for the amount you pay. So it's the best value per unit ME of any supplement that we can use. And it matches well with protein in pastures to, to get adequate protein and really, really high energy. So you're functionally increasing your stocking rate. Same concept as a lamb system, but it's used in a number of systems like that. Um, one of the problems with the beet bucket in very uh, wet soils or very heavy country is that you can make a mess with the tractor. I mean, as a rule, you, you're going across it once, you're not doing it too bad. We do that in some really wet areas and we get away with it. Um, the beet buckets don't pick up a lot of mud. So normally there's no issue on that and it can be taken away in a normal silage wagon. The second part of that question around transition, there's, I guess there's two components. Um, if they've been on a primary diet, so beet is their primary diet, either 100% or you know 95% of their diet, and they've been on for an extended period of time, when they go back to pasture, there's a, a period where uh, there's a change over in their rumen, but it's not a transition to speak of. It's just uh, an adaptation back to uh, optimal rumen performance that takes a little while, but there's no animal health or production issues that are involved with it typically put back on good quality ryegrass after beet, their intakes will go up, not down. So there's no there's no real transition back on the grass. I say that so the audience can hear it clearly because I, I understand that there's um, a little bit of material out there saying that, you know, you had a transition on to beet and you had a transition off to beet and uh, it's not true, it's, it's ridiculous actually. But there's another component, if they're going into um, lambing 
indoors, then um, in all cases of that, they'd be fed a reasonable quality energy diet that will very, very likely contain uh, starch in some form, cereal grain, concentrates, etc. Now, in those cases, uh, if that's true, then there is an adaptation of the rumen back onto starch. So there's no, uh, they've been on a lot of sugar when they're on beet, and there's a, a different rumen and a different adaptation to much lower water loads and a different feed when they go back in. As a general rule, with the, the quantity and the quality of the pre lambing diets that are fed, that adaptation period is less than a week. So it's not a particularly strong period and you don't have the same difficulties that you do say in cattle, for example, when you're adapting it. Remember sheep um, regulate their intake much better on beef than uh, other livestock classes do. Okay, very conscious of the time, it's five past. We've got two final questions that are great questions, so I'm going to put them to you. Um, the first one is about lamb growth rates. So what are lamb growth rates between birth and eight weeks like for yows that have wintered on beet? So is there enough protein, the right amino acids to maximise milk output from the yows? Yes, um, that's an excellent question whoever asked that one and clearly they've been reading some of the New Zealand material. So I'll apologise in advance for that New Zealand material because it's dreadful. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It's just dreadful. And um, there's a little bit to be said around that. I mean, the, the first thing to say is that um, in, in a couple of the uh, specific instances that were reported on, the... The, the management was very poor. I mean, no, no uh, experienced operator would do what was done in those cases. And uh, if the management is poor, and that will normally mean the allocation's poor, and particularly the protein energy balance will be poor, largely agronomically, they're gonna have poor leaf or they're gonna allocate to the point where they're either getting too little leaf or they're getting too little bulb. And there's, you can be wrong on both those sides, as we've said before. Then in those cases, both body condition gains and the protein intake, so the general protein intake of those ewes can be affected. Um, to put a point in the sand for it, uh, the metabolizable protein, so that's not the crude protein intake, but the metabolizable protein requirement in the reference standards for the top end ewes, so this is for multiples that are very, very large ewes, is 140 to 150 grams of metabolizable protein a day. Now, that is uh, relatively easily achieved on 3% uh, intakes on agronomically well-grown beet crops where the crude protein is 13% or above. Now, the mistake that was often made in some of that material that was put out was the way that they calculated the crude protein of the diet. So in some cases, what they were doing was uh, take, picking up beet and giving it to them. In some cases, they were calculating the total crude protein of that beet that was put in front of them by pulling the beet out of the ground and doing as we said before, what's the total crude protein of the bulb, what's the total crude protein of the leaf, therefore what's the total crude protein of the plant. Of course, if they're leaving a, prone, a proportion of that bulb in the ground, that's not the crude protein. And it was a significant misunderstanding in a number of those um, reported instances. In general terms, what we've demonstrated for quite a while is that uh, the the live weight gains and the body condition gains are fantastic, number one. Number two, the metabolizable protein uh, requirements can be met without any difficulty on those beet systems. And number three, the amino acid supply for them, because the microbial protein supply is so rich and is so strong on beet systems, is excellent. So to answer the final end of those ones, there's no difficulty in either milk production or early lamb growth after that on well-managed, well-run systems and no reason why anybody in Scotland can't achieve those systems. And final question for the night, on a small scale enterprise, can beet be lifted and stored, but they're asking if once the tops have been utilised? Yes, the short answer is yes. Um, you can chew the tops off in either uh, late autumn or winter. Remember, if you chew the tops off in early autumn, you've still got significant growth in that crop. So there's a cost of doing business if you do that. And you have to be reasonably careful if you're going to do that. But you can chew the tops off, um, particularly as we said, if you move quickly, um, they'll, they'll move across and take all the leaf. You can then pick up those bulbs. They're still able to be picked up with the beet bucket uh, and um, they can be stored. 
In cold weather, they last about six months in uncovered windrows on the ground. So yep, you can store them for long periods of time and that's very commonly done in New Zealand. Great. There is numerous questions that we've not got to. It is almost 10 past nine. So we're, um, any questions we've not got to, we will make sure you get a reply and we can email them through to you. Um, I just want to highlight that we've got a few more webinars coming up the next couple of Wednesday nights. So next Wednesday, again, we're going to have Jim joining us from New Zealand and it's going to be a focus on beef. So beef have to be treated a lot more sensitively than sheep on fodder beet. And it's a lot more easier to kill cows on fodder beet than it is sheep. So anybody who's thinking about grazing cows on fodder beet or finishing cattle, growing cattle, then please tune in next Wednesday. And the following Wednesday, we are going to do a focus on dairy. So please do register for those if um, either beef or dairy will interest you. We'll also have a evaluation form sent into your inbox tomorrow. And if you can please fill in that evaluation, it just lets us see that we're delivering what you would like. And you also get entered into a prize draw when you fill in that evaluation. So please do that. Um, I have one final question I'm going to put to you, Jim. Apologies. Somebody wants to know what time it is in New Zealand. Uh, at the moment, it's uh, 10 past uh, 10 a.m. in the morning, so it's uh, no, no difficulty there. And I was going to tell you, Kirsten, I've got all day, so you can keep asking questions. But what, maybe one suggestion is um, uh, you and I are doing some podcasts uh, independent of the webinars. Maybe we could use those questions on a separate podcast. I can answer them and then you can put them up as a appendix for uh, the farming community to go back and listen to. I hate yes. to leave questions in the breeze like that. So maybe that's one way we could do it. Yeah, no problem at all. But thank you very much, Jim, for joining us this evening. And of course, to all participants for joining as well. We've had a great crowd tonight and thank you. And hopefully we see you next Wednesday. Thank you. That's a, my pleasure for doing it. And thank you to the listeners. See you again.